On the night of July 19, 1996, the whole world watches as 54-year-old Muhammad Ali sets the cauldron ablaze at the Olympic Games in Atlanta. The sight of the Olympic gold medalist and three-time heavyweight boxing champion defying Parkinson's disease to light the Olympic flame warms public affection for a man who three decades earlier was a racial and political lightning rod. It was a great thing for the country. It was a great thing for Muhammad Ali. But if he were not sick, would America have allowed him to do the same thing? Muhammad Ali has been beatified in some ways because he's no longer threatening to the establishment. People forgot that there was a time when Muhammad Ali was very dangerous. He was dangerous in the ring. If he goes down again, it's over! Yeah, I'm the greatest fan that ever lived! I still got the world! I still got the world. I still got the world! But some saw him as dangerous outside the ring. Out of all people, it takes an Uncle Tom Negro to keep continually calling me by a slave name, which is a white name, Cassius Clay. He was against the war when, for the first time, we as Americans actually said, no, this isn't right. He was a champion when we were gaining black pride and civil rights. He was our moral conscience. He was our athletic dream. Muhammad Ali epitomized what we were all about in the 60s. He was on a spiritual quest, breaking out, coming out of Louisville, going on that search for meaning, going to the Olympics, coming back, meeting the dark forces, three and a half years of exile while he's fighting for his life, and then coming out on top. It's the hero's journey, man. I'm going to save boxing. I'm good looking, clean living, cultured, and I am modest. <laughs> The man who would become Muhammad Ali is born Cassius Marcellus Clay in Louisville, Kentucky in 1942, the era of the segregated Jim Crow South. You know, a black man was always supposed to be subservient, always supposed to say, yes, sir, boss, and you're supposed to just, you know, play that game forever. When we woke up in the morning, the first thing that comes to your mind is that your blackness is going to be what white America is going to look at and judge you by. Blacks, if they were lucky, could aspire to be teachers, but that was the top of the social strata. Most often it was the black citizens of Louisville who raped manure into the backstretch of Churchill lands. Cassius and his younger brother Rudy are raised in Louisville's struggling black middle class. Cassius Clay didn't grow up in a ghetto. His family lived in a very modest but comfortable house. He had two parents at home. There was always enough to eat. He always had money for clothes. Clay's father is a skilled sign painter, a proud and volatile man. You know, my grandfather, Cassius Clay Sr., you know, he's kind of my father's genes, you know, very extroverted and bold and, and loved himself. So he got a lot of that from his father. Odessa Clay was a very sweet, nurturing woman. And when you looked at Cassius, you saw the two parents fused into one personality. As with many classic heroes, the origin of Muhammad Ali involves a twist of fate. In 1954, 12-year-old Cassius Clay rides his brand new bicycle to a black business expo in downtown Louisville. Cassius spent some time walking around, getting free candy, seeing what was there. When it was time to leave, he went outside, and his new red and white Schwinn bicycle had been stolen. Somebody told him that there was a policeman in the basement of the building teaching youngsters how to box. Furious young Clay finds Officer Joe Martin in the Columbia gym. Clay is ready to fight whoever stole his bike. Martin calms him down and suggests that if he wants to fight, he should first learn how. Martin teaches the 89-pound Clay how to box, and his teenage student is eager to learn. Within weeks, young Clay wins his first amateur bout. It's the start of something bigger than either of them can possibly imagine. There was another black trainer 
at a black gym named Fred Stoner, who he also worked with. But Joe Martin was the person that was held up and put out front for the publicity. Here's the white policeman. He taught this young fellow how to box. It's a feel-good story. Ambitious, driven Cassius Clay becomes a National Golden Gloves champion. It's a TKO decision for Cassius Clay. Rock and roll pioneer Lloyd Price often gigs in Louisville. But despite the fact that his song Stagger Lee is topping the charts, he's got to find lodging in a guest house on the black side of town. There was a corner spot called River's Lounge, and I would go there because it wasn't far from the guest house. And this young Cassius Clay would always come by there, and him and his brother Rudolph was his name. And uh, he said that he's going to be the champion of the world. He always had a big mouth, you know. I'm going to be the champion of the world. You know, he had all this energy, and he was ambitious. And the young guys at that time uh, wasn't thinking like he was thinking. John F. Kennedy is running for president in May of 1960, as 18-year-old Golden Gloves champ Cassius Clay wins the U.S. Olympic trials in San Francisco, then goes on to take the light heavyweight gold medal at the Summer Games in Rome. 1960, I'm in the Olympic Village in Rome, and this person is sitting on some steps, and he's got a gold medal around his neck, and he's talking about what he's going to do with his life in very loud terms. And the thing that caught me about him, I noticed all the women turned around when they got five yards away to take a second look. But despite all the attention he gets in Rome, Clay finds that Olympic gold still won't buy him a place at the table in his own hometown. Here we were being idolized as competing athletes on one hand, and then on the other hand, there were certain restaurants you couldn't go in. You know, it's not fun for people to tell you, yo, you can't eat here. It's irritating when people try to hold you down. You don't get up and start chanting. You know, <laughs> you know, you get up and start swinging. Boxing in 1960 has been a notoriously corrupt sport, rife with mob influence and crooked managers. Into this cesspool step 11 prominent Louisville businessmen backing their hometown Olympic hero. The Louisville sponsoring group were composed of white men uh, who had good intentions. They were going to help Clay be something, keep him out of the clutches of evil. With the sponsoring group in his corner, the former amateur Olympian begins his professional career on October 29, 1960. Tony Hunsaker is the first to fall victim to Clay's raw talent. Realizing their promising young fighter needs an experienced professional trainer, the group sends Clay to Miami to work with Angelo Dundee, who had trained world champion Carmen Basilio. Few people in the history of our game were ever finer cornermen than Angelo Dundee. Angelo used to say, this kid does everything wrong. Does everything wrong. But it comes out right. He did everything what they would characterize as being wrong, fundamentally. He kept his hands down, he swayed back and forth, he just pulled out of way of punches just by middle meters. Over the next two years, Dundee guides the unorthodox clay to 19 victories in a row against a parade of heavyweights. Some are a challenge for the flashy young fighter. Most are not. Heavyweights were not known to be that fast, and that mobile, and that fluid. Guys couldn't hit him, especially heavyweight. He might be big and he might be tall, but if he mess with me, he sure will fall. Gaining self-confidence, Clay starts predicting the round his opponents will fall. That he's going to knock him out in four, he did it. He's going to knock him out in five, he did it. Seven, he did it. You know, that self-confidence is amazing what it will do to you. You want to make a uh, prediction in rhyme, or are you going to work on that for a while? Well, it'll have to be in rhyme every time. My father had to market his fights and doing poetry and making rhymes. And I never forget, I said, Dad, where did you get that from? And he says, you know, he goes, there was a wrestler, Gorgeous George. Gorgeous George. He would say he was pretty, and he would comb his blonde hair, and he had two chicks on his arm, and people would just hate him. 
They would just fill the whole auditorium just to see this guy get hit. Inspired by Gorgeous George, Clay creates his own supremely confident persona. Float like a butterfly, stay like a bee. Oh, run the young man oh. Ali's the archetype for a rapper. Cockiness, the brashness, the offensiveness, the abrasiveness. Hip-hop is about revolution. Hip-hop is a voice for the people. Ali is the people's champ. Ali is the revolution. The real dive will come on November the 16th, and in your heart, you know I'm right. He's new to this game. He's got all these microphones and cameras in his face. He knows that there's a portion of the country that despises him and hates him. Ali was completely hip-hop. By 1963, Clay's audacious antics make him unpopular with many sports writers and boxing fans. There wasn't much that the older generation liked about Cassius Clay. The way he dissed them, laughed at their questions. A hint of the wise is sufficient. I remember seeing a Joe Lewis fight. Um, they asked him his reaction. He said, I'm glad I win. Suddenly there was this guy who was not only articulate, but almost poetic, and with a great deal of braggadocio to boot. I am the man this poem is about. The next champ of the world, there isn't a doubt. <laughs> if he told funny poems, it would be one thing. But he tells funny poems and tells you how great he is to have written them and how great a fighter he is, and he's the greatest of all times. That rubs some people the wrong way. He was the best at everything. He was the most beautiful, and he hadn't really proven himself yet. So people are looking at him like, who does he think he is? But the example of a proud, confident black man appeals to a young generation who admire the fact that Clay isn't afraid to represent. To African Americans, he was a source of pride in that he took great delight in who he was and in broadcasting it to everyone. Just to say that you love yourself and to have self-pride showed people that they can do the same. He made me feel proud to, you know, to be a black man. He just represented a symbol of strength to me. I'm going to make boxing popular again. Me with my beautiful, colorful personality. 21-year-old Clay is eager to prove he's more than a pretty face. Now a top heavyweight contender, he campaigns to fight the reigning champ, Sonny Liston. He went after Sonny with a vengeance. I want that bear. And what's gonna I happen to him? Bear. What's gonna happen to him? He might be great, but he'll fall in eight. He's driving a bus onto Sonny's lawn, and he's yelling, I want the bear. Get the bear out here. Come on, bear. It was starting to get under Sonny's skin. I'm big ugly bear, I'm tired of hearing Liston. Everywhere I go, they're talking about Liston. I can't wait for him, and he's going to fall in eight. He really tormented Liston. And finally, Liston said, yeah, I'll fight him. It'll be easy money. Everybody believed that Liston would annihilate this guy because uh, he was all talk. If Sonny Liston whoops me, I'll kiss his feet in the rain. With a record of 36 and 1, Liston is a fearsome champion former mob enforcer with ties to organized crime. He's frightening. Sonny was a guy who was meant to hurt people. Sonny Liston was Godzilla. Sonny Liston was going to reign for a thousand years. Adding to the foreboding sense of drama was the presence of members of the controversial Nation of Islam. Nation of Islam was an isolationist group uh, Elijah Muhammad wanted his own nation inside the United States. You know, so it was, it was scary. For the past few years, Clay has been studying the tenets of the Nation of Islam, as espoused by its leader, Elijah Muhammad, who preaches that white people are devils created by an evil scientist. But Clay is drawn to the basic message of black empowerment. It made him understand and promote what is your history? What is your African history? Who are you? What is your name? Why do you have that name? I'd never heard anything like I heard going to the meetings with Ali about you are somebody, a black man got as much right to live as any other man. For the first time in my life, as a grown man who had been a star, had sold millions of records, you start to feel like you are somebody. I can understand how you got hooked. 
Clay is inspired by the nation's assertion of black pride, but the presence in his camp of the Nation of Islam's controversial Malcolm X threatens the Liston fight. Malcolm X, I, uh, I want to talk with you briefly about your affiliation with Cassius. How long have you known him? About three years. Just months before, Malcolm X caused an uproar by suggesting that President Kennedy's assassination was a case of, quote, the chickens coming home to roost. You did not say that you were glad the president was killed. No, that's what the press said. The promoter fears that negative publicity will kill ticket sales, so Clay's camp gets Malcolm to leave Miami until the day of the fight. February 25th, 1964. Boxing experts and fans agree that Liston will clobber the Louisville lip. They thought, well, even if it's going to be fast, it's going to be really ugly and bloody. Just what we fight fans want. It was fast and it was bloody, but it was not what most fight fans expected. The challenger from Louisville, Kentucky, Cassius Clay. When the two men entered the ring, we suddenly realized that David was bigger than Goliath. Another jarring right hand that time, folks. Another one, Sonny Wobble, Sonny Wobble. Cassius has him hurt. Clay dominates Liston from the bell, dancing around the slower champion and opening a cut under his left eye. After seven punishing rounds, Liston claims an injured shoulder and won't come out for round eight, making Cassius Clay the new heavyweight champ. I don't have a mark on my face, yeah. and I upset Sonny Liston, and I just turned 22 years old. I must be the greatest. Right. Uh -huh. I told the world. There were a number of people who immediately said, oh, the fix was in. Sonny Liston quit against Cassius Clay. He was just getting beaten up. He didn't like it. He was a bully, and he couldn't take it. After his stunning upset of Liston, Clay holds a press conference that would only amplify the shock factor. Somebody said, are you a card carrying member of the black Muslims? And he blew up. Clay confirms that he's a member of the Nation of Islam. He, and he said, I don't have to be what you want me to be. I'm free to be who I want. This is about as revolutionary a statement as I've ever heard in sports. Now the heavyweight boxing champion, Cassius Clay, is free to be himself. No one could get their mind around the idea that this great kid from Louisville, raised by a Baptist mother, was suddenly announcing that he was a member of the Nation of Islam. A few weeks later, public opinion of the new heavyweight champ goes from bad to worse. Cassius Clay is a name no more, is that right? Yes, sir. It's Muhammad Ali. Muhammad means worthy of all praises, and Ali means most high in the Asian African language. This is the toughest guy on the planet. He turns his back on Christianity. He turns his back on his family name. And it began the split between people who loved him and people who hated him. My name is Muhammad. Y'all keep calling me Cassius. I'm tired of telling you. You know, you're intelligent. My name is Muhammad Ali, not Cassius. There was anybody special gave you the name? Yes, sir. My leading teacher, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad's influence is growing. Not only does he give Ali his new name, he introduces him to Sanji Roy, who becomes Ali's first wife in August of 64. Muhammad Ali had four wives. Sanji, Kalila, Veronica, and now Lani. I found the first wife in, in a strange way, maybe the most interesting. She was very firmly in love with him. Their honeymoon is short-lived. We no longer had Cassius Clay. We now had Muhammad Ali, who was a member of the Nation of Islam, which made him very unpopular. It was getting very hard to find a place where he could fight. Originally, the Liston rematch was set for Boston. Then Muhammad suffered a hernia. The fight was postponed. Boston washed its hands of it. And it finally wound up in Lewiston, Maine, which is one of the few places that would take it. Then, two months before the rematch, Malcolm X, who had broken with Elijah Muhammad to embrace Orthodox Islam, is gunned down by members of the Nation of Islam on February 21st, 1965.
Muhammad Ali had broken from Malcolm and sided with Elijah Muhammad. So there was concern that Malcolm's followers might exact retribution against Ali. The rumor had been spread that there was a carload of gunmen coming up from New York to kill Muhammad Ali in the ring. Ali Liston, too, was a mess. It was a mess outside the ring, and it was a mess once the fight started. Midway through round one, Ali hits Liston with a blow that would become infamous as the Phantom Punch. Did you see the punch? Did you see it? Was it the punch heard around the world? It wasn't even a punch seen around the world. The punch was hard enough to knock Liston down, but he thought Liston could have gotten up. It took about eight seconds after 9 and 10 that the crowd began to chant, fix, fix, fix. Ali's second disputed win over Liston does little to win over his boxing critics. He has other critics as well. A certain portion of black America loved him. Another portion of black America did not love him. The black community was divided. Those who thought integration was a great thing and those who did not think of integration in that way but thought of equal rights and, uh, and our freedom, equality, and justice. I'm not out there marching and going places I'm not wanted. Those of us who were young, who understood our manhood, and who took pride in it, we were not asking to be a part of white America, but demanding our rights just like any other citizen. Ali's support of the Nation of Islam's separatist policy alienates many in the civil rights movement, including Floyd Patterson, who turns his November 65 bout with Ali into a social, political, and religious battle. He said uh, a black Muslim has no place being heavyweight champion in America, and that he, as a Catholic, was going to bring the title back to this country. Floyd was a nice man. But his approach was what we call an Uncle Tom approach, doing all the things that white America wanted you to do. You ain't nothing but an Uncle Tom for white people. What's my name, Uncle Tom Negro? I'll jump on you now. What's my name? When Muhammad Ali got him in the ring, he became pretty cruel in his beating of Floyd. He was really giving him a lesson talking to him hitting him and talking to him. Ali would disable Patterson, then step back, admire his work, and then beat on him some more. Ali beats Patterson by technical knockout. Two months later, he sues his wife Sanji for divorce. She'd lost favor with her husband's increasingly influential Muslim inner circle. They said it was because she wore makeup. She wore daring dresses. They didn't want her because they had already picked out Kalila, who was working in a Nation of Islam restaurant. His brief marriage now over, so is his six-year contract with a Louisville sponsoring group. Herbert Muhammad becomes Ali's manager. Herbert Muhammad was the son of Elijah Muhammad, who Muhammad Ali counted as his spiritual father. Uh, Herbert was an extension of that. Herbert Muhammad joins with pro football superstar Jim Brown and lawyer Bob Arum to form their own boxing promotion company, Main Bout. What we said was the heavyweight champion of the world is boxing, and we should control boxing. But Main Bout can't control the U.S. draft board. Ali was rejected for service in 64 when he failed the written test. But the Vietnam War is escalating in February of 66 and the Army has lowered its standards. Weeks before his bout with Ernie Terrell in Chicago, Ali is notified that Uncle Sam wants him. The fight was doing extraordinarily well when the U.S. government reclassified Muhammad Ali from 1Y and made him 1A, and a television reporter went to Ali, who was training in Miami, before anybody could reach him. I just don't understand yet how I can be reclassified as 1A without testing me in no way, just 
calling me like this, and I just don't understand it. In other words, uh, you think they called you only because you're the heavyweight champion. And a Muslim, too. And that's when Ali said, I got nothing against the Viet Cong. They never called me the N-word. Everything hit the fan. Ali declares that if he's drafted, he won't fight in Vietnam. Ali put it in racial and religious terms that made him a hero to millions of people who thought that it was a bad war. When he basically said, I ain't going, um, a lot of us were kind of like, yeah, baby, <laughs> I ain't going either. I'm just trying to figure out another way of doing it so that I don't have to go to jail in the process. Well, then you're, you, you're not apologizing for the unpatriotic uh, uh, statements that you made. That'll be taken up with the government. Ali's unpopular stand causes Chicago politicians to scuttle the Terrell fight, leaving his management looking for another fight in a new venue. We wanted to fight in uh, Pittsburgh, and they ruled it out there, and then they tried Maine, but they didn't want us in Maine. The growing controversy over his anti-draft stand makes Ali toxic in the U.S., forcing him to win his next four fights in Canada and Europe, where he's a bigger draw than ever, a point not lost on one Texas millionaire. I got a call from this real character, Judge Roy Hoffines, who owned the Astrodome in Houston, and he said, you bring that boy down here, nobody is going to tell him he can't fight here. Ali knocks out Cleveland Williams before a record-setting indoor crowd. Smelling another box office bonanza, New York hosts Ali's next victory over Ernie Terrell. Ali is now 28-0 in the ring and still 1A in the draft. In April of 67, he finally gets his draft notice and reports to the induction center in Houston to begin one of the longest, toughest fights of his life. Former world heavyweight champion Cassius Clay refused to take the oath of induction into the army. The black Muslim fighter, who is also known as Muhammad Ali, was immediately stripped of his title by the World Boxing Association. When a guy says he's not going to fight for his country, that irritates a whole lot of people. He moved from the sports pages to the front pages. Within days, Ali is stripped of his license to box in all 50 states. Nine top Negro athletes meet with Cassius Clay to discuss his anti-draft stand. Jim Brown and Bill Russell organized a summit meeting in Cleveland. Clay's induction refusal cost him his title, and he faces a possible five-year prison sentence. The Army was willing to make a deal. They were willing to guarantee that he'd go on special services and he would be able to box. Behind the scenes, Herbert Muhammad, as a businessman, looked upon that as a possible option. The meeting started with them talking to Ali about accepting the deal. You wouldn't have to worry about being a soldier as such. You can do public relations. But Ali's attitude was, nope, <laughs> don't want a deal. Two weeks later, Ali is convicted of draft evasion in federal court. Sentenced to five years in prison and banned from boxing for three years, he remains free while his case is appealed. Whatever suffering or punishment I may have to take, it'll all be because of my religion. He was unafraid of the political repercussions, unafraid of any cultural repercussions, unafraid of losing money. He said he would probably fight again, but it was okay if he didn't long as he believed that he was the people's champ. That was good enough for him. A month after his conviction, Ali marries 17-year-old Belinda Boyd with the approval of Nation of Islam leaders. She fully supports her husband's refusal to be drafted. He said, I can't kill anybody. I just said, trust me, you'll be the greatest man ever lived if you don't go. Facing five years in prison and unable to fight while appealing his case, newlywed Ali needs to earn money, so he embarks on a college lecture tour. I would like to hear this from you, and I want the world and the cameras to hear it. Who's the heavyweight champion of the world? The student audiences loved his opposition to the war in Vietnam, 
but they were very much opposed when he spoke to them against the idea of interracial dating, against the idea of living in the same community. During those three and a half years that he wasn't fighting, uh, basically the only two things that he was doing uh, was going on college campuses, and the other was being on television with Howard Cosell. What do you say to that? I predict that the fans will be angry at the experts for misleading them so much. I think that his relationship with Howard Cosell was critical to his acceptance by America. Howard had the deepest respect for the champ. Howard many times privately uh, defended Ali and Ali's right to express himself and the right to feel the way he felt about where we were with civil rights at those times. But Howard also didn't take any punches. If he felt like Ali had overstepped his bounds, he would confront it. It was part of the chemistry of these guys. You had two gigantic egos. After three and a half years in exile, Ali remains free as his appeals proceed in federal court. And while politics cost Ali his boxing license, politics provides a chance to fight again. Georgia has no state boxing commission. Individual municipalities can sanction a fight. So black state senator Leroy Johnson strikes a deal with Atlanta's white mayor, Sam Massell. Leroy Johnson said, I want this fight to happen. I carry a lot of votes with me. Thus, Ali's comeback begins, surprisingly, in the Deep South. Here's an African-American reviled around America. Suddenly, Atlanta is embracing him. He said, I got my license. I'm going to fight in Georgia. I'm going to fight in Georgia. I said, in Georgia? <laughs> I said, down south? He said, yeah. I said, oh, Lord, you in trouble now. Ali returns to the ring on October 26, 1970. I don't believe that anybody is happier than this young man to once again step into the ring. 28-year-old Ali was stripped of his title, but he's never lost a fight, and Jerry Quarry is not considered competitive. Ali opens a cut over Quarry's eye in round three, and the fight is stopped. Inactivity is deadly for any fighter, and for Muhammad Ali to have come back and, and still display the incredible hand speed and fluidity that he showed was amazing. While Ali's draft evasion appeal works its way up to the Supreme Court, the NAACP sues the New York State Athletic Commission in federal court, arguing that their ban on Ali is discriminatory. Their ban is lifted. Free to fight in New York again, Ali stops Oscar Bonavina at Madison Square Garden in December 1970. It's over! Ali is the knockout winner! Setting up a title shot against Joe Frazier for an unprecedented $5 million purse. Now we have a chance to see who the real champion of the world is. That was revolutionary, you know, $2.5 million apiece? Wow. Back then, that was a vast sum of money. Even Mickey Mantle was not making that much money. Oh, well, let Joe Frazier talk all he wants. We got a few miles to straighten all this mess out. He brought people to the sport that didn't even necessarily follow boxing. They just liked Muhammad Ali. I have fixed up the round that Joe Frazier will go down. You got this person who's standing up and he's, you know, he's been stripped of his title. People wanted to see who is this guy. His fights meant more than just the sport of boxing. His fights were like a fight for justice. Ali was carrying the weight of everything. I don't think it's possible to overstate how much Ali embodied the hopes, aspirations, beliefs of young people in general and young African Americans in particular. Joe's going to come out smoking, and I ain't going to be joking. The bout is set for March 8, 1971. As the fight approaches, the battle between two unbeaten heavyweights becomes far more than a boxing match. You you your hands off me. If you were a liberal, you were rooting for Ali. If you were conservative, you were rooting for Joe. It was a clash of cultures. There were 
the people who were uh, demanding civil rights, who were against Vietnam, and the people who thought Vietnam was right, then damn it, we're going to put our views in the ring and settle it once and for all. March 8, 71. The world flat out stopped. The apartment that we lived in was going crazy for that fight. We were glued to the radio. I can still see Ali leaning back over the ropes, saying, no contest. Meanwhile, Frazier's pounding him, you know, 20 times. Ali absorbed an enormous amount of punishment, gave out an enormous amount of punishment. Yeah, and when the 15th came and they said he'd been knocked down, it was like, this can't be. Ali gets quickly to his feet, but the damage is done. Ali suffers his first loss. It's Frazier by unanimous decision. This can't have happened. This is impossible. It was impossible not because we didn't believe Joe Frazier could beat Muhammad Ali. It was impossible because his beating him meant they were right. And they couldn't be right. And the right-wing idiots and the hard hat guys and the ugly Americans, they were standing in the way of history. They were standing in the way of change. They were on the side of wrong. And so they couldn't be right. They just couldn't. In the first blush of defeat, Ali was gracious and elegant. He was perfect in giving Frazier credit. I've been always handing out the defeat, so now I'm defeated, and now I can see how other people felt. And when I do come back, if I ever do, I'll have a more of a hunger and determination, which is something you lose in the intoxication of so-called greatness. By the next morning, he'd been robbed. He went on every late night talk show. He convinced half of America or more that he had won a fight. And it killed Frazier. And he was the only one who believed coming out of that fight that he would be champion again. Four months after his unanimous loss to Frazier, Ali wins a stunning unanimous decision in the Supreme Court, which overturns his conviction for draft evasion. I mean, nobody would have believed that that could have happened when Ali refused to step forward. With prison no longer looming, Ali is free to renew his quest to reclaim the title that had been taken from him, a title now held by George Foreman. Ali's momentous match against Foreman is an event unlike anything boxing has ever seen. In 1974, promoter Don King and a consortium of backers make a deal with Zaire Strongman, President Mobuto Sese Seiko, to host a worldwide live satellite broadcast of the Rumble in the Jungle. Ali basically showed that he could transcend the sport. He brought half of the media of the world to Kinshasa Zaire. Ten long years after he first shook up the world, 32-year-old Ali is once again challenging a heavily favored champion. Foreman was uh, the second coming of Sonny Liston. Remember, this wasn't an ordinary heavyweight. This was a guy who could knock down walls. Everybody felt that Ali was going to get hurt. This was a, you know, this was a monster. I was so afraid that George Foreman was going to kill Ali. Both fighters train in Zaire for the bout on October 30th. But it's Ali who is embraced by throngs of African fans. It's unreal the amount of people, 10 to 15,000 people in the crowd following him, just shouting his name. Ali Bumaye, Ali Bumaye. He'd say, stop the car, and he'd get out, and he'd Bumaye, Bumaye. He just wanted to create a crowd. Pretty soon, you couldn't even walk across the street. All of that worked in Ali's favor. I mean, he was playing psychological games. He's punching voodoo dolls. He's, he's got people beating on drugs. The champ is here! Do, 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 do. The champ is here! Me and maybe one other person thought he could beat George Foreman. He believed it. He believed it. Ali's confidence isn't shared by many boxing experts. But during the fight, Ali would add rope dope to the lexicon and a great new chapter to his legend. Ali stands back, ties his man up, leans on the rope. Ali goes back on the ropes, and the ropes go back more. And Foreman misses by that much. Wild left hand is not scoring. Angelo sends his corner guys around to the corners. He says, tighten the ropes, tighten the ropes. And Ali's saying, oh, leave him, leave him. 
Ali formed, in his mind, he formed the rope dope right there and then. To take that kind of punishment from a guy like George, you know, who knocked most guys out like they were rag dolls. I, I can't fathom taking those kind of blows from a guy who punches that hard. Those punches could crack ribs. How could you take this in your body? And Ali was taking it. And a foreman was punching himself out. I had predicted that foreman was going to annihilate him. And in between rounds, when he started to wear George down, he said, hey, big fella, what do you think now? Not George out. When Muhammad Ali put George down, he had proven that he is indeed the greatest. The great man has done it. Ali beats for me. Humiliates. He stops and he says, fellas, you'll never know what this means to me. That should have been his retirement. How can you top that? You went through the trials, your ups and your downs, your glory times. This is the time to retire. He had proven the point. You can't go any further once you prove the point. And there's something about the romance of athletics that is hard for people to give up. For him, every fight was a, another drama, another circus, and he loved every minute of it. All those available ladies, all this love and admiration, very hard to walk away from that. When Elijah Muhammad dies in February of 75, his son Wallace leads the majority of the Nation of Islam toward traditional Sunni Islam. Ali, who has always had white men in his corner, embraces the change. Prejudice is a two-way street, you know? He was driving down one side of it at one point in his life, not unlike Malcolm X, who had a similar journey, and he evolved. He said, whites can become Muslims. Now he says, so you can become a Muslim. And he hugged me. There wasn't any racism in Ali. Later that year, Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos plays host to the third Ali Frazier fight, the Thrilla in Manila, on October 1st, 1975. They'd been the two most dominant fighters of their time. Towards the end of their career, oh, here they are again in this big fight, and this is going to be the culmination of it all. For both fighters, it would also mark the beginning of the end. The fight took place at about 11 a.m. Manila time, outside the hot Philippine sun was beating down and inside this fight between these two great athletes was going on. These two guys was going at each other like they was going to just kill each other. They both took an enormous beating. They were both heroic. Pendant. After 14 rounds of battle in the sweltering heat, Frazier and Ali, both mentally and physically spent, go to their corners to await the final round. That moment that you're sitting in your, on your stool, your, your, your eyes swollen shut, or your legs are gone, you're totally exhausted. You look across and see your opponent, and he is just as in bad shape as you are. All of a sudden, your mind and your heart says, that's ready to go? And either you answer yes or no. Most guys say no. The special ones say yes. Ali was the one who said yes. Joe couldn't answer the bell. And Ali just passed out in the ring. It's all over. He said it was the nearest thing to dying. In the year after his punishing victory over Frazier, Ali defends his title four times, including a brutal 15-round win over Ken Norton. His longtime ring doctor, Ferdy Pacheco, sees the writing on the wall. Pacheco went to Norton's locker room and told him, congratulations, you just ended Ali's career. Norton had lost, but Ali was physically beat up. The following year, his speed and skills diminished. Ali survives a 15-round slugfest with Ernie Shavers. Muhammad Ali, not down but hurt. The hardest hitting heavyweight in boxing said that Ernie Shavers hit me so hard that my ancestors in Africa turned over in their graves. Which was a fabulous line, except the way that he said it was just the beginning of a slur 
in his speech. In February of 78, Ali loses his title to Leon Spinks, a novice with just seven fights under his belt. But he's not done yet. Fights Spinks again, beats him, regains the title, and then Don King gets Ali to fight Larry Holmes. And I was absolutely horrified. The Holmes bout is set for October 1980, a year after Ali's last fight against Spinks. His deterioration is evident. Even to those of us who never looked at Ali with clear eyes, it was clear that he was done. Holmes wins by TKO in the 11th round, the first time Ali has ever failed to go the distance. Whatever damage had been done to Ali in all of these 12, 15 round fights, all of that had come together to leave him a shell of what he once was. A year later, Ali steps into the ring one last time to fight Trevor Burbick on December 11th, 1981. The whole family went, and up until the fight, we were begging him in his hotel room, don't fight, you don't need to do this anymore. After the loss to Burbick, Ali finally calls it a career. It's hard to tell a champ that it's time, it's over, because we always believe we can always win that fight. Ali fought, that's what he did. And we, who loved him, really had no say in it, and no right to say, no, we don't want you to fight anymore because it ruins our memory. Well, he had a right to say, I will choose when I'm gonna leave it, and he did. The first few years of retirement were hard for Ali. He was no longer in the spotlight as heavyweight champion of the world. But the worst thing was that the Parkinson's syndrome was becoming clearer and clearer. When you stay in the ring too long, it's going to really start wearing down on you. And that's exactly what happened to my father. Ali's Parkinson's syndrome is made public in 1984. It's really hard for me and everyone else to see a man who used to be so great with words. Now that's one of the things that he can't do. It's a sad thing because you wonder what he would be saying now. We need that Louisville lip because there's nobody speaking for African Americans or Americans like Ali spoke. That voice just isn't there. When Ali stopped really talking in public and really doing his whole Ali thing, he has said so much that it, it, it still echoes. I have enough inside here and inside here to replay it for life. We're in a hotel room in Las Vegas at an event. And this is like 90s, so the Parkinson's is, he can still walk, but he's talking very soft. And he goes, you know, I want to make it to heaven, and I wasn't a perfect person, and this Parkinson's shut me down. I can't do nothing wrong now, you know? <laughs> but he said, I'd rather suffer now than in the hereafter. By 1986, Ali is five years into retirement, and on his third marriage, he and his second wife, Kalila, were divorced in 1975. He was doing a lot of cheating. He's weak for women. I just didn't know how weak he was. Ali's next marriage to Veronica Porsche would last 10 years. My father would say he was the best Muslim he could be, given that he was this gorgeous Adonis boxer <laughs> that all the women loved. In the summer of 86, Ali and Veronica are divorced. Later that year, he marries his fourth wife, Lonnie Williams, who he first met in Louisville back in 1963. In 1996, Ali would make a memorable return to the global spotlight. We were thinking who would be an American Olympian who could light the cauldron that would mean the most to people watching around the globe. Ali was the guy who made the most sense. And it was not met with wide open endorsement. There were some people who said, well, you know, what, he was a draft dodger, wasn't he? Misher and Ali's longtime friend Howard Bingham work out a deal in which they agree to keep Ali's torch lighting role a secret. Howard Bingham calls me, your dad's lighting the torch. Don't tell anyone. Just call your sisters and brothers. And I'm in a control room at the bottom of the stadium with 26 cameras and, you know, 
directing the world feed. But even down there, in the bowels of the stadium, I could hear what was going on up there. And I never dreamed that it would be that strong and that powerful. You know, when my father gets nervous, he shakes more. So he's shaking the torch, and I'm like, oh, Lord, Dad, gonna burn down the stadium. <laughs> there was a part of me saying, oh, my God, look at Muhammad, feeling sorry. But then there was a, a, the other part of me said, for God's sake, that's Muhammad Ali. To have predicted in 1967 how much Ali and his personality would resonate around the world 20 or 30 years later, there were a lot of people that would have said that will never happen. The transformation of Ali from the most hated man in America to this beatified Ali of today. A complete reversal. But those of us who, who, who believed we were in the right back in the 60s, this simply validates it. That, hey, you finally came around. You know, you couldn't stop the march of history. He saw where it was going. He pointed the way. You hated him for it, but you couldn't stop it. Ali is awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in January 2005. Later that year, the nonprofit Muhammad Ali Center opens in downtown Louisville not far from where his bike had been stolen over 50 years before. His legacy is that when you believe in yourself, no matter what the odds are, if you're on the right side of history, and if you perfect your craft, you can accomplish anything. He stood up on a level that nobody else stood up, and he had a platform that no one else had, risking his personal success and his personal wealth to basically tell the truth. People today are fond of saying, yes, Muhammad Ali stood up for his principles, but there's been a determined effort to wipe away cognizance of what those principles once were. Don't wipe out the memories of what Muhammad stood for in the 1960s. Take it, build on it, and show how Muhammad Ali and America both changed and came together in the end. He was no saint, he was no devil, he was Muhammad Ali, and nobody else ever was or ever could be. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. A lot of people think that I dislike Cassius Clay, but this is not true. I happen to like him. I got to know Cassius Clay back in the years where they took his crown. And I found him to be not like the press says he is, you know. I found, to, found him to be pleasant, you know, uh, very sociable. He's outspoken. I admire him for that quality. And I happen to like him. But I still think within myself that I have the ability and the quality to beat him. Wow. Patterson qui refuse toujours d'appeler le champ par son nouveau nom, consacre deux heures par jour à la boxe, ou plutôt aux jeunes élèves blancs d'un foyer de drogués. Floyd le fait très gentiment, hors de tout contexte politique. Well, people like him, we call Uncle Tom's. Uncle Tom was a Negro who wanted to stay a slave. Uncle Tom was a Negro. Whenever the slave master's house caught on fire, he would say, Master, our house is on fire. Whenever the master got sick, he would say, Master, are we sick? Whenever the master has some old clothes, some old chicken bones, he give it to Uncle Tom. So he's, we got two type black people today. One want to be independent, one want to be black, one want his own name, he wants to learn his culture. Then we got a black man with a white mind who likes his European name, he likes his European language, he likes his European Jesus, and he wants to marry, he wants to past and marry the white girl, and he lives in white neighborhoods. His children all go to white schools. He's a black man in a white world. So that's why he says that, because he has no knowledge of himself. And he's mentally dead to the truth. 
But one day he'll wake up, and he'll know that I'm right. So he's a good boxer. White people call me Muhammad Ali, you, but that shows you how he is mentally. He don't want to respect my name because it represents darker people and unity because that's so much different from what he believes. He believes in total difference things than I do. He he don't like himself or his people. He don't speak for black people. He don't take part in marches. You never hear him talk like me. He's a different type man mentally. He's slow. So I cannot blame him. As Jesus said when they killed him, he said, forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. So uh, he knows not what he do, so I overlook him too. Given the penalties, the maximum legal penalties that this act could uh, result in. Number six, one, he brings six, uh, ammunition uh, on his face, and he's only. Number six, one, six, he's the only man? man? Yes. Okay. Sergeant Lawson, come take charge of this prisoner here. One six, got one POW, pistol belt, canteen, black pajamas, no haircut, no weapon. Over. That's one six. You want me to keep moving? I've got a Lima Zulu right here, or I can wait for a sideshow two, or I can hold him till he's picked up. Over. Ali ne voulait pas cautionner cela. Uh, one six, uh, Roger. You want me to leave a Romeo with him? Over. <laughs> Now, if I was asked to go to war, and it was an unjust war, uh, one would say, "Well, I wouldn't go," but I would have to go, just or unjust. I would have to go because of my neighbor, my neighbor around the corner, my neighbor across the street, she lost her husband. The lady down the street lost two sons. So because of that, my guilt feelings would overpower me. I would have to go. Stephen Williams in the dark clouds begins to press the attack. In Europe, son refus de servir étonne. On le croyait fanfaron, peu sérieux. Et le voilà qui prend une décision réfléchie, lourde de conséquences. Et puis, on l'imagine mal refuser le Vietnam et chercher à remonter sur un ring. Comment peut-il encore accepter la violence de la boxe What is my purpose in not going to Vietnam? Killing babies, killing mother, killing daddy with guns and steel and fire and bombs and poison. My purpose is to kill them. But when I go in the ring, my purpose is not to kill them. That's why Ron Lau was on the ropes. I told the referee to stop it. He was hurt. Jerry Quarry was on the ropes. I told her, this on record. I told the referee, I said, stop it. I had James Ellis on the ropes. He was about to fall out. I told the referee I wouldn't hit him. They said I carried my opponents because I wouldn't kill him or hurt him. I might cause a brain concussion. I might cause a hemorrhage. He might die. He's got a family. So I wouldn't kill him. So whoever says that Muhammad Ali didn't go to Vietnam but he can box, tell him that Muhammad Ali backs up what he does with actions. Three opponents, I didn't hurt them because they were unconscious and the referee couldn't see it, but I did. So my purpose in boxing is to talk to people like in your country, to help poor people, to use my title to represent the little people. Because big people, when they get famous, they don't talk to little people no more. They ride around with limousines and bodyguards, and they're like they're better than some people. My purpose in boxing is to become great, to become world famous, and still be humble to speak the truth for little people, regardless of race, creed, or color. So I got I'm not wrong for boxing because my purpose is good. But Vietnam, my purpose is to kill, so that's bad. Thank <laughs> you. 